Hemorrhagic disease of the newborn is caused by vitamin K deficiency. Though not common, I did see a patient who had a brain hemorrhage from having a lack of vitamin D, and it was terrible. Now, most of the time in hospitals, they're going to want to give vitamin K as an injection, but there are some families who are hesitant. There are oral options available as well. So let's talk about it. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. David. Hope you're having a good day out there. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about vitamin K, um, why it's done specifically in the newborn period, um, concerns that I hear from some parents about the vitamin K injection given to the newborns, and the different types of protocols injected versus oral. Um, As somebody, as a pediatrician, you know, one of the obviously very first sta- um, standards of care treatments that's done after a baby is born. So something during my days, during my residency that we did during um, in the, in the newborn care period, certainly something that um, our parent, our parents are told about. Um, and we talk about if we do a pre a prenatal appointment. Um, but certainly some of you guys, we ask about if they get vitamin K at every first appointment if for a newborn. Okay. So of course, it's something that we've just, you know, I, I came up with in the pediatric field, something that I do still advocate for. But of course, in my ever, in my never ending desire to try to help educate people, have them understand what their, um, what their options are, you know, keeping to the health so they can keep, make the best decisions for themselves. We're going to talk a little bit about this today. Okay. So, um, and you know, because of the fact that I do get off asked about alternative treatments, so we have one here. Okay. So first of all, why is vitamin K so important? Because, pardon me, it's an essential nutrient for clotting the blood. It is not passed along through the placenta. So once the, um, so um, a baby in utero, a fetus is not getting vitamin K, and therefore there is no vitamin K available after the cord is cut either. Okay. Now, our intestinal bacteria make vitamin K. And that's why it's this is rarely a problem once one's older in life and one has established a healthy gut microbiome. But of course, a baby is sterile when they come out of the womb. They haven't seeded their good bacteria. If if the mother had taken an antibiotic, if the baby took an antibiotic after birth, or um, um, if there was a C-section, that baby may not be seeded with a good amount of the good bacteria or the good bacteria maybe didn't have a chance to take because of the antibiotics. So there are also certain circumstances where a baby might be at more risk because of the fact that they took antibiotics that they would be delayed in their ability to make vitamin K. Okay. Now it is something vitamin K that is found um, in food, Um, green leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, um, Swiss chard, collard greens. It's also found in cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, Um, cauliflower, um, turnips, and Brussels sprouts are high in them, and also some fruits like avocado, bananas, and kiwi. But of course, these are not things that we are giving to a newborn baby. Okay, so um, what we're talking about here also is um, that to be aware, there are two, there are actually multiple types of vitamin K. Okay, you may have heard me talk in the past about vitamin D deficiencies. And if we are giving people high doses of vitamin D, or even if they're not deficient, but we're trying to push the vitamin D level up, that will balance it out with vitamin K. That is called vitamin K2, MK7. This is not what we're talking about today. We are talking about vitamin K1. It's a similar um, vitamin, but it is not vi- it is not the same thing. Okay. Now, in terms of this um, condition itself and the reason why, why I'm bringing it up. So, this hemor- so there's actually two names. Okay. Hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, that was an older name for it. Now, it's just flat out called vitamin K deficiency bleeding. Okay. And of course, that can happen to older people as well. We're going to focus really here on the newborn period. Now, how common is is this hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, this vitamin K um, in the newborn. So in a non-treated state, the chances of having a, a, a hemorrhage, so most often it'll happen in the, in the brain. It can also happen in the intestinal tract. Um, untreated, without vitamin K, about 1 in 10,000 um, newborns will develop this. Okay. Now, um, in the hap- and, and typically um, the most common time to see it, there's a kind of like an earlier in the first couple weeks, but there can be a late onset up to like 8, 12 weeks after as well. Okay. Now. Half of the babies who have this issue, it is a brain hemorrhage. 20% of the babies who get a brain hemorrhage do unfortunately die. So kind of a big thing. Now, 
in terms of the more what we call late onset vitamin K deficiency of the newborn, when people do take the oral form of vitamin K at, when the baby's taken at birth, and again, compliance this is a thing which we'll talk about in a minute, between 1.4 and 6.4 um, cases of hemorrhagic disease in the newborn is seen per 100,000 people. Okay. Before we were talking about one in 10,000, this is for 100,000, okay? And when given intramuscularly as an injection, between 0.25 and 3.2 per 100,000 um, would, would, would go on to develop it. So anywhere between a half to um, a quarter um, of the cases when comparing intramuscular to oral, but certainly oral better than if not doing it at all. Okay, so in terms of some of the concerns that I hear about the injection, Number one, the pain that's associated with it. We don't, parents say, I don't want to do something that may interrupt my baby's first day of life, you know, coming into this world and we want to have a peaceful first life. We don't want it to interfere with, um, with breastfeeding. Um, certainly, you know, what I tell people is it's not the first thing that needs to happen. I have no problem if, um, uh, if want to nurse the baby first, let the baby suckle, get some um, time, you know, that little chest time as well. Um, that's perfectly fine, okay? Um, it's the same thing you don't want to be waiting um, days, but you can wait an hour or two for this, okay? Um, now, also, the, some of the concerns that are expressed about the um, injection um, um, are some of the other ingredients. So um, there are things in there like um, polysorbate, um, polysorbate 80 in particular, propylene glycol, um, a form of castor oil called polyoxyl 35 castor oil, which is a modified form form of propylene glycol. Okay, um, there has also been a concern that has been expressed because people may have read about a link to leukemia. Okay, so let's talk real quickly about that story. So this goes back to 1992. There were 195 children with ch with childhood cancer compared to 558 of them. And when they looked at the different types of cancer in this study, they found that there was a statistically positive um, for leukemia in those who did get the shot versus those who didn't. That's a, That was a pretty small study. And over the course of about the next decade, six very big studies were done about this, much larger including there was a meta-analysis that was done for all of them. And they did not establish the findings of the leukemia. So a smaller initial study showed it, but the vast number of papers that came out afterwards did not support that there was actually a leukemia risk. Certainly that would be scary if it was. Okay. Now, in terms of this, so what we're talking about is preventive measures, giving vitamin K before there's a hemorrhage. Of course, if there's a hemorrhage giving, it could potentially make things um, better in terms of ongoing hemorrhage. But you want to catch this before a hemorrhage happens, of course. Um, now, as I said, the most standard way is done is an injection. The main, in the main advantage of the injection is it's one and done. You don't have to worry about doing it ever again. It's just, it's it, okay? Um, it is given into the muscle. It's done intramuscularly, usually into the thigh. Um, again, it has those ingredients that I mentioned, which is a concern. Now, among those three things, again, it's the polysorbate 80, um, the propylene glycol, and the poly 35 castor oil. Now, the Environmental Worth Group, which is the people who do the uh, Clean 15 Dirty Dozen and the Skin Deep, they have assessed those three chemicals. And they do score them in a one to four, but that's um, which, you know, so zero is none up to a 10 is like the most dangerous um, carcinogenic, teratogenic form. Um, and they these rank in the one to four range. OK, now I do also notice that that first of all, that's for topical. Right. Something rubbing at the skin, not injected through the skin. Um, and also those are in older people. So we don't we, we certainly cannot assume that the safety for an older person is the same for a one hour old person. Right. I mean, lots of things aren't that way. Um, blood brain barriers aren't developed. Gut brain um, barriers are not developed yet. So it's not, you know, you can't make a full apples to apples um, comparison on adults on their skin and babies being injected. OK, now, in addition to the injectable form, there is an oral form available of the vitamin K1. Um, an example of this is from Biotics Research. It's called the Bio K Emulsion. I happen to like this one in particular because it's got 500 um, micrograms per um um, per one drop, so it's nice and concentrated, so it's easy to give people. Now, the other ingredients in that are water, sesame seed oil, and some Arabic gum. Okay, some people try to avoid the guns. We're talking about one single drop, so of course, there's not a lot in there. And of course, it's safe to say that in the shot, there's not a lot, a huge amount of liquid there too, for, for that matter. 
Okay. Now, in terms of the dosing regimens, okay, as I said, a one-time IM shot, intramuscular shot, you're done. Um, on the oral side, there is no definitive recommendations for the oral vitamin K. And it's clear most of the medical um, academies of pediatrics and things like that all do clearly say that the injectable form is better. And of course, the numbers do show that, right? Even though the oral does have a significant perfective event, protective effect compared to not at all, okay? But this is what the American Academy of Pediatrics says. All newborns should get a half to one milligram injected. Um, and they say more research is needed to assess the safety and efficacy of oral vitamin K. Okay, at least they're saying they're not squashing it. You know, they're just saying, hey, you need more research in Canada. They also say, they note in Canada, that a single dose of oral vitamin K is probably not effective. But they do feel that a series of oral doses does work well. This is from the Canadian Pediatric Society. So what they will typically do is giving one to two milligrams um, by mouth on the day that they're born, at two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks, and then done. So four doses, okay? Um, of course, you know, could a parent eat? forget that they could, especially six weeks out, especially with all of the other things that we have going on when we have a newborn. Now, in New Zealand, um, they say, quote, if parents are not agreeing to give an intramuscular, then the alternative is to do it by mouth. And they give two micrograms, uh, milligrams, excuse me, um, oral at birth, um, two milligrams three to five at three to five days of life, and then another two milligrams four to six weeks. And they do specifically note there, if the baby does vomit within an hour of taking the dose, that they should repeat the dose. That's fine. Okay. In Australia, um, again, they stress that intramuscular is the preferred way, but they say parents can elect to do the oral form um, by doing it at birth. They said doing it like before the newborn screen is done, the little foot prick that we do for the different types of um, congenital um, and um, types of diseases that can be seen. That's, you know, um, and there they typically do it at three to five days. Here we typically do it at 48 hours. So it's a little difference there. But then they said then to repeat it at four weeks. Um, and they say that it, in their wording is if, if 100 percent compliance is kept, it may be as effective as intramuscular administration. OK, so what's my take? First of all. Vitamin K in both the oral as well as the intramuscular forms are safe and effective, okay? Um, with an advantage, as I said, being towards the injectable form. It does seem as if the association between leukemia and the intramuscular form is weak at best. There's just, it, I just wasn't impressed by looking at the, at the studies, okay? There does seem to be, as I said, a little higher incidence of um, hemorrhagic disease in the newborn, and those were given a single dose of oral for sure, um, compared to the single dose of the intramuscular, but the risk does seem to diminish as you get into more doses out over those first two months of life. Now, I actually did a little analysis and I came up years ago with a plan that would actually meet the um, what, what they say in Canada, what they say in it was actually a one in Germany too, New Zealand and Australia, which is to do the following two milligrams. So, again, if you're doing the 500 microgram per dose, it'll be four drops. You put on the nipple, you can put on the finger. Well, might as well, you know, on tongue, easy to do. Um, you do it after the first feeding. OK. Um, then you do another two milligrams three to seven days later. Um, and again, if there's going to be a newborn metabolic screen that needs to be repeated, or if there's going to be a circumcision, you want to do it um, before that happens. OK, so if no second dose is given during that first week, then to um, um, then give it at, again at two weeks, four weeks and six weeks, the same two milligrams. If the second dose is given during that first week, then I would suggest repeating the two milligrams at, th at week three and five. So there would still be the, um, the, the same number of doses, just we're moving it up a little since we would have moved the, the, the second dose up some. Now, if a second dose, um, if the baby does vomit within an hour, I do agree also to um, repeat the dose if it's done in an hour later. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so there you go. So, you know, the one thing I would absolutely not do is to skip the vitamin K altogether. As I said, I don't personally have much of an issue with giving the injected, but, you know, I realize how um, some people have their concerns and I totally respect that, you know, we're here all about health education and choices. And so at least we do have what seems to be a pretty solid alternative um, as long as one's compliant, you know, whether we have to set a, a smartphone alert um, on our calendars or something in order to remember to do these things. But if it's done the proper way, it does seem to significantly minimize the chances of developing the hemorrhagic disease in the newborn as well. All right. 
So hope you have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.